Grace to you and peace from the one who is and who was and who is to come, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, ruler of kings on earth. Our text for this morning comes from the epistle reading from Revelation 22, especially these words. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This is our text. You may be seated. Dear saints, I know you are familiar with this prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let thy gifts to us be blessed. Amen. It's not time for lunch yet. But we often refer to this prayer as the common table prayer. As a quick computation, I calculated that I have said this prayer somewhere between 35,000 and 45,000 times in my life. We say it every Sunday before we have lunch, every Wednesday during Lent and Advent before we, as a congregation, join for dinner. We said it in my house as I was growing up before meals. We said it with our children before meals. Carrie and I still say this prayer before we eat. It's a simple prayer. Easy enough for a child to learn a mere 15 words, including the Amen. And yet, despite its simplicity, it has much to teach us, even if you said it 35,000 times or more. What is it that we're really praying for? Did you notice in our reading from Revelation how some of the words of that prayer appear? The prayer, Amen, Come Lord Jesus, is the last prayer in the Bible. Then it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? That we would keep praying this prayer in some form or another until our Lord returns in glory. Because that is one of the things that we are praying for in this prayer. In fact, it is probably the chief thing, namely, that Christ would return. Consider John, the author of Revelation. He is quite old by the time he writes these words. He has been exiled to the island of Patmos on account of his faith, both for what he believed and what he taught. No doubt he is suffering in a remote place that is not his home, away from his family, away from the congregation he was likely called to pastor, possibly with other convicted criminals. Life does not look good. And yet in that suffering, he is given this vision, this picture of Christ, of heaven, of the heavenly host praising the Lamb, the new heaven, and the new earth. And so he must really be yearning for Christ's return and glory. He saw it so vividly. He desired it. And we Christians in our day and age should want that as well. We want Christ to come again in glory. We know that it's going to happen. We confess it every week in the creed. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. The kingdom of Christ's reign visibly over us, his people, and the new heavens and the new earth begins when Christ returns. For us Christians, that will be a glorious day. We should have a great desire for it. On that day, the dead will be raised. Those who have died in the faith will enter into the new Jerusalem, the eternal city described so beautifully in Revelation. We will live in bliss and purity and righteousness forever. When Christ returns in glory, all of our prayers will finally be answered. How so? 
How will Christ's return answer our prayers? A couple of weeks ago, we heard these words from Revelation 21. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Aren't those the very things that we pray for? An end to tears and crying and sickness and pain and mourning and an end to sin, indeed an end to death itself. That is what we pray for. Twice in our reading, Jesus promises, I am coming soon. He is coming to put an end to all of those things, giving the final yes answer to all of our prayers. So we continue to pray, come, Lord Jesus. But this prayer, this sentiment, this desire that Christ would be among us, isn't only a prayer for Christ's second coming. It is not an only an end times prayer that we are praying, but we desire and we need Christ's presence with us now. In the common table prayer, we also say, be our guest and let thy gifts to us be blessed. Come Lord Jesus isn't only a prayer for Christ's coming on the last day. As we pray this prayer, we are inviting Christ into our midst now, in this time, in this place, where we are. And that's a pretty bold thing, wouldn't you say? You are inviting the reigning king of the universe, whose glory is beyond compare, whose power is beyond measure, whose knowledge and wisdom is far beyond our understanding, and you're inviting him to sit down with you at the table. Bless the humble meal that you are about to eat in your humble surroundings. You are inviting the king to dwell with you, his humble people. That's really quite something. Be our guest, Jesus. Come sit with us. Bless us with your presence. Bless this food, which we know is a gift from you. But the gifts of God, of food and drink, not the only gifts that he brings to you and blesses. Indeed, there are far greater gifts. Forgiveness of sins, eternal life, salvation itself. Our works bring only spiritual death, for we are permeated with sin. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We need Jesus to bring us these gifts as well, and so we pray for them. We need him to forgive our sins, to bring us salvation, to keep us in the faith as his holy people. So we pray, come Lord Jesus. Sadly, Christ's second coming is not good news for those who rejected the first one, who deny their need, his, their need for his presence now, who reject the gifts that God brings and thereby reject the giver. For Jesus also says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. And we are told outside the gates of the city are the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. For those who have wandered from Christ's word, who have rejected his gifts and rejected the Lord's grace and mercy, Christ's return signals only their eternal death. They will be outside of God's city. When Christ returns, the time of grace is over. The opportunity for repentance and faith will have ended. And so while we wait for Christ to return, the church is at work in this evil world. Verse 27 of our text says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. 
and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desire take the water of life without price. The bride of Christ, that is the church, prays, as does the Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus. And we pray not only for Christ to come to us, but for the world, for our neighbor, for those outside of the church, for the ones who are thirsty for righteousness to come to Christ. The church is those who say to the unbelieving world, come. With Jesus, we say, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We desire that others would come to the water of life, the waters of holy baptism, the water that is without price. These waters are a gift. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Those who thirst for Christ's righteousness find it here, in the living water of baptism. And you are one who has been brought through those waters, for you are those of whom the angel speaks. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life. They may enter the city by the gates. You have had your robes washed in the blood of the Lamb, made white. You are those whose names are written in the book of life in heaven, those who have been granted citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. You are those with whom Christ will dwell forever, you with him, and you with one another. So we continue to pray. Pray for Jesus to come to you in his word, in his sacrament. Pray that he would come to you with all of his gifts, your daily bread, yes, but also the heavenly food which he wishes to give you. Pray that he would be your guest as you eat your earthly meal, and that you would continue to be his guest at the heavenly meal, his body and blood given from this altar. Pray for his return, to put an end to sickness, and disease, and murder, and evil, an end to sin and death. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In his name, amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.